Thank you all for, for being here. This is uh, overwhelming to stand up and talk after Nancy's uh, introduction here, but um, I'll try my best to focus on the presentation. But before I start, I want to uh, just um, say hi to my parents in Belgium. Um, I hope they're listening right now. Um, <laughs> we don't know for sure if this is working, but uh, hopefully <laughs> Uh, they, they will uh, hear and see me and, and the rest of you. Uh, I also uh, want to say hi to my family here in Ann Arbor. I'm glad that they made it. Uh, and uh, many of the colleagues and friends who are here, thank you all for being here. Um, without um, further ado, I'll just uh, jump into my presentation. And uh, you see in my title slide here, um, I'm acknowledging, of course, uh, the College of Engineering and, and Dave, uh, as well as Altarum Institute for providing the funds for uh, this endowed professorship. And uh, you can see that with this picture of uh, my research group that was taken about a year ago, I believe, uh, I want to acknowledge all my current and former graduate students and postdocs. And I'll get back to that a little bit later on in my talk in several occasions. But uh, you could see here uh, that uh, I have an incredible group of, of uh, students and um, you know some of them have left and some of them are still here and some of the newer ones are in the, on this picture but but this kind of uh, gives you a sense of uh, the community that we have and, and the work that we've done uh, that I've been able to do is, is truly thanks to uh, these people and all the ones who are not on this photograph. Okay, so let me get started with my presentation. Um, and I want to uh, ask you to focus a little bit on my talk, uh, on my title, I mean, uh, Environmental Biotechnology and Global Water Sustainability. I picked this really broad general talk. You are probably all wondering what is she going to talk about when she picks a, a, a title like this. And I did it on purpose because I didn't know what I was going to talk about when I was asked to uh, <laughs> provide a title. So I came up with this very general talk so I could pretty much talk about everything, right? Um, so let me um, explain what I mean by environmental biotechnology and Nancy already alluded to this. So this is one definition that I think Nancy and I would agree on perhaps. Uh, use principles of microbial ecology and ecological engineering to solve environmental problems and develop sustainable processes through the use of microorganisms. Um, the second part of my talk, global water sustainability, that could be a little more controversial, but one definition could be to provide access to safe water and sanitation for the world's population without compromising the ability of future generations to meet these needs. When you uh, look into this in a little bit more detail, uh, you realize that this is a huge, um, 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 this, is, this is, is going to be very difficult to achieve uh, if we know that nearly 800 million people lack access to safe water and over two and a half billion people lack access to sanitation. So if we have about <coughs> 80 people in this room, 10 of you would not have access to safe drinking water and would um, you know, potentially have lots of infectious disease, diarrhea, um, due to not having access to drinking water. And um, many more of you would not have access to sanitation. So. Uh, this is a, a very, very broad topic, and we do touch on this topic in our research extensively, but certainly we don't have uh, solutions. And so when I was thinking more about my talk, I tried to narrow the scope a little bit. So I narrowed it somewhat uh, to focus on sustainability for the urban water cycle. That's still a very broad topic, but uh, I'm going to uh, begin to narrow things here when I move on. So here is my first uh, attempt to try to narrow things. And then when I talk about water cycles, maybe the first thing that comes to mind for many of you is this picture, the natural water cycle that you've probably seen in elementary and middle school. Uh, it's a very complex process. Um, or com there's, there's many things going on in this natural water cycle. But when we add humans to this, things get even more complex. And this is a cartoon of uh, what we think about as the urban water cycle. The natural water cycle is represented here in the back. But you see that there's many things added. We have dams, we have drinking water treatment plants, sewage treatment plants, we have irrigation, <laughs> runoff, stormwater runoff. So things are getting quickly a lot more complex when we think about uh, urban settings. And 
To think about this in the context of Ann Arbor, uh, I took uh, a Google map of Ann Arbor, and um, I'm wondering if all of you know where um, this urban water cycle comes into the picture when we think about Ann Arbor. So to help you, um, I have um, uh, localized uh, the majority of our drinking water source is from Barton Pond up here. So 80% of our drinking water comes from Barton Pond, about 20% is groundwater. That goes to the drinking water treatment plant, which is in the northwestern part of Ann Arbor. Uh, from there, the water is distributed all over town, not just in this area, of course, all over town, um, and goes to your homes and to apartment complexes used for irrigation for the little bit of industry that we have. Um, after you use your water, it goes through the wastewater collection or sewer system to the wastewater treatment plant, which is in the south eastern part of town, close to Parker Mill, Gallup Park. And after treatment, the effluent is discharged back into the Huron River. Okay? So keep the geography of this in mind when you think about the urban water cycle. All right? The northwestern part of town, the southeastern part of town. This will come back at the end of my talk. Um, so I also uh, did this because uh, we are talking about both drinking water treatment and wastewater treatment in the urban water cycle. And I want to touch on some of the challenges that we face in Ann Arbor and in general in urban settings. Uh, we often don't have sufficient uh, quality water available, so there's very limited access to uh, pristine water sources. Water is always polluted. Um, we often don't have uh, enough quantity of water available, so water supplies are limited. Think about last year's summer, about 60% of the U.S. had severe droughts. Uh, so even just in the U.S., we often have a lot of water quantity issues. And then finally, uh, the treatment and the transport of water and wastewater is very expensive and energy intensive. So these are some of the general broad challenges that we deal with. And so what I want to do in my talk today is uh, show you some examples of the research that we do in environmental biotechnology that address or work towards solving these challenges. Um, so uh, it's obvious that because of these challenges, the current water cycle isn't sustainable, so we're working to make the, the urban water cycle more sustainable through research in our particular case, and hopefully that research is being translated in applications and implemented in uh, municipalities and industry. Um, so this is what we do in environmental biotechnology research. I'm going to give you some examples from our work on drinking water to try to make drinking water treatment more sustainable. I'll do the same for the wastewater area. And then I'll conclude by uh, having you think about how we can uh, perhaps close the urban water cycle to try to recover drinking water from um, treated wastewater. So I'll start with the examples from the drinking water field. And I um, uh, have three areas that I'll touch on briefly. I'll spend a little bit of, about, a little bit of my time talking about how we can um, use environmental biotechnology to expand biological treatment in the drinking water field. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how we can perhaps decide to reduce disinfection and explore opportunities to improve the quality of our drinking water to, um, by, by having um, beneficial microbes in our water. So starting out with the expanding of the biological treatment, um, I'm a real uh, fan of biological treatment, as you probably have figured already by now, but um, in the drinking water field, biological treatment hasn't been trivial. Um, there was a, there's been a lot of resistance to it. Uh, drinking water treatment traditionally is done by physical chemical treatment processes. And here are some of the reasons why I believe that biological processes can really help us, um, there's uh, lots of advantages to biological treatment processes. Um, in many cases, you can convert a compound using a microbe to a, 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 a innocuous compound, a non-toxic compound. You can do that with minimal chemical addition. You uh, have typically higher water recoveries, typically lower cost, lower energy requirements, and you can often simultaneously remove mm -hmm. multiple contaminants. So there's many advantages. Um, and 
the reason we haven't really implemented biological treatment in the drinking water field as much as I would like has to do with some of these issues here, the public and industry perceptions. When you think about using microbes to treat your water, everybody's concerned that these microbes end up in your treated water and will make it to your tap. And there's something to that, of course. If you look at the cross-section of a drinking water pipe, you see a lot of things that you may not want to be there, that you don't expect to be there. And oftentimes, this corrosion scale is there thanks to biofilms, microbes that grow in these pipes and enhance the corrosion in the pipes. Um, so this is reality that we have to deal with. Um, and uh, my thinking is that there's no way we're ever going to avoid microbes in our drinking water, whether we use biological treatment or not. So if we can't avoid the biological, the microbes in our drinking water, we might as well embrace them and try to uh, use them to our advantage. And this figure kind of drives that message home. This is tap water that's traditionally treated. Uh, and you could see that the cells per milliliter of water are numerous between 1,000 and 100,000 in tap water, which translates into millions of microbial cells per liter of water. This is treated water uh, that's perfectly safe to drink. Most of these microbes are non-pathogenic. So there's really not that big of a concern. Um, if you look at bottled water, by the way, uh, things aren't better. In fact, they're worse than tap water. So we just live in a world where there's lots of microbes, and so we might as well embrace them and try to take advantage of them in our treatment processes is the message that we would like to convey. Um, so this uh, is slowly changing. There are some other obstacles that we have to deal with from a more technical process perspective. Uh, we are, for example, dealing with low temperature conditions where maybe biological treatment isn't always straightforward. Um, so these are things that we can work on with research. Uh, unfortunately, not a lot of research has been done in this area yet. Uh, the environmental biotechnology field is very much focused on wastewater treatment rather than drinking water treatment. So really, there's limited research to support this <laughs> development, and that's slowly changing. So we're going to continue to work <coughs> on this, and I'll show you an example of uh, a couple of treatment uh, processes that we've developed uh, towards this goal. Um, you know, there's huge potential to work in this area. Uh, all these contaminants can be removed using biological processes. Uh, we have focused on a few so far. We've focused on these inorganic contaminants, and I've highlighted the ones uh, that can be removed by the technology that we have developed. Um, and uh, you can see there is nitrate, nitrite, perchlorate, bromate, chromate, selenate, arsenic, uranium, and sulfate. These are all contaminants that are present in various drinking water sources that can be removed by microbial processes. And to really show you that this is relevant, I've uh, taken these maps from various sources, and I have listed the contaminants that we've so far worked with and a couple of the other ones that we are talking about working with um, uh, and have given you in parentheses the, uh, the um, regulatory standard that we need to bring down the concentration of these compounds to, to meet uh, drinking water standards in the United States. And you could see that for compounds like arsenic, we need to bring down the arsenic concentration to very low levels. Um, and it's the same is true for some of the other ones. Uh, some of these with question marks, uh, this means that we don't have a federal standard yet. There's a standard in California, for example, but there will be a standard coming out in the next couple of years, and we expect it to be within this range. Uh, similarly, for chromium-6, there's no federal standard, but there is a standard or a proposed standard in California that just came out a few days ago. It's 10 microgram per liter, so there's potential for a lot of work in this area. Um, just to give you an idea of what we do is we take these contaminants such as nitrate and perchlorate, microbes can use them as a substrate, as a food source if you will, and convert them to innocuous compounds like nitrogen gas or chloride uh, in this case. This is uh, relatively straightforward. Um, in some cases things aren't quite as straightforward when you have a compound like uranium-6 uh, it can be used as a food source by a microbe, but it's going to be converted uh, into reduced uranium, which precipitates out, forms a solid, and that solid then needs to be removed by filtration, for example. So things aren't always straightforward like they are in the cases of nitrate and perchlorate. 
And uh, certainly in the case of arsenic, things aren't that straightforward. And we have a long-standing project uh, that we uh, have been working on, uh, the biological removal of arsenic from drinking water sources. And I want to talk to you a little bit more about that project. And um, this project uh, has been funded by numerous sources. As you can see, it's a long-standing project. We've tried to get together a lot of funding. But I especially want to highlight uh, the graduate students who've worked on this project, the ones that are in bold, are students who are currently here. Uh, some of them haven't specifically worked on arsenic, but have worked on related contaminants. And I want to also highlight uh, my long-standing collaborators on this project, Jess Brown from Corolla Engineers, uh, and Kim Hayes uh, from our department. Um, to kind of frame the reason we started working on arsenic is that arsenic is a contaminant many of you have probably heard about because it's such uh, a wide uh, concern. It's a, it's a global concern. It's both a natural occurring contaminant as well as a contaminant that's there because of uh, pollution. So even if you don't have any industrial pollution, you still often have arsenic problems. It's the case in the US, and this is the USGS map again, where you could see that the, the red, uh, orange, and yellow areas have concentrations of arsenic that are of concern, where treatment plants have to remove arsenic. You can see here in the thumb of Michigan, we definitely have arsenic in our water uh, to a level that the treatment plants in the US are removing arsenic. It's, it, it, it's possible to do that, and people are doing a good job in the US with this. It's, it's expensive, and it's a headache for treatment plants, but they're doing it, and arsenic is not a real concern in the US. It is a real concern in South Asia, in countries like Bangladesh, um, Nepal, um, up here, Bangladesh, and parts of India. The concentrations of arsenic in groundwater are huge, and uh, people um, are really dying because of arsenic poisoning. Um, in a country like Bangladesh, one in five deaths are due to arsenic poisoning. So 20% of the people who die in Bangladesh die because they've been exposed to arsenic. That's how severe this problem is. And um, arsenic removal technologies are available um, and are being used, especially in countries like the US, but also to an extent in, in Bangladesh and Nepal and India, not to the extent we would like to, but certainly there are technologies available that they're dealing with this problem. Um, and one of the reasons we started working on this project has to do with the type of technology that's being used. So most of these technologies use oxidized arsenic um, treatment technologies that produce waste that's not stable when you dispose it. And to give you an idea of that, I have this uh, schematic here. The oxidized arsenic is removed in these technologies through adsorption to iron hydroxides. And uh, when this waste is disposed in either a landfill or a pond, it's possible that this uh, oxidized arsenic dissolves again through reductive dissolution. And so you basically have the potential of um, recontaminated your water sources because of this uh, type of technology. So the technology that we developed uh, tries to deal with this by uh, using a technology that works under reducing conditions. And so this is a schematic mm -hmm. of a lab scale uh, bioreactor system that we developed. Um, and these, these bioreactors are basically glass columns that are filled with granular activated carbon, similar to the charcoal that you use on your grills, very high adsorption capacity and high surface area for microbes to grow on. And here is a scanning electron micrograph of um, a GAC, granular activated carbon particle, and you actually see a nice biofilm and even one individual bacterial cell on this carbon. And so when these GAC or granular activated carbon has biofilms, we call it BAC, biologically uh, active carbon. So these processes that we developed um, take the arsenic and uh, we also take advantage of sulfate in the water uh, to reduce these to reduced compounds that can then combine to form precipitates and can be removed by filtration. At the same time, we have uh, more biological processes taking the oxidized iron, reducing it, and this reduced iron can further combine with the reduced arsenic that can be um, adsorbed to uh, uh, iron sulfides. 
So we have two removal mechanisms, mechanisms for arsenic in this case, and through elaborate uh, uh, characterization work that Kim Hayes was responsible for, uh, we characterized these two types of compounds in our system, and we are confident, uh, because of a lot of other analysis, that this is really the mechanism of removal in these reactor systems. Um, in in follow-up work, Dara Clancy is now working on evaluating the fate of various arsenic wastes in relevant environments. She's looking at the oxidized waste that's currently being generated in a lot of treatment technologies, as well as the reduced waste that we're generating with our technology. So this gives you an example of how you can use very fundamental research to develop a reactor uh, process, a technology that um, you can then implement in the drinking water field to expand biological treatment options for drinking water treatment. Um, I also want to touch briefly on disinfection uh, as an example of um, how our research in environmental biotechnology can be implemented. And I have a long-standing project that looks at mechanisms of bacterial response to drinking water disinfection. Uh, this, this work uh, is uh, a collaboration with uh, Chuan Wu Shi from the School of Public Health. Uh, and uh, one of my former postdocs, who's now a faculty member at the University of Glasgow, Amit Pinto. And here are the graduate students and postdocs who have worked on this project over the years, and currently there's only one of them left, Derek Clancy. Um, so I wanted to put up this slide again to remind you that even in the presence of disinfectants, we have millions of microbial cells per liter of water. So our treated water has lots of bacteria. Um, that doesn't mean disinfection doesn't work. Um, when we look at an inactivation um, experiment um, and we plot the um, abundance of microbes over time, I'm simplifying things a little bit here. This is the, basically the log removal versus the concentration times the time of exposure. You can see that there is a reduction of the number of bacteria uh, throughout the disinfection process. Okay, that makes sense. That's what we would like to see. But at the end of the day, we still have a lot of bacteria left in our process. And when we look at the composition of bacteria throughout the disinfection process, what we'll see is that different bacteria will survive disinfection due to differential resistance to the disinfectants. And so to show you some of these results, I've I'm first showing you here the relative abundance of different populations of microbes at time zero before we disinfect. And here are the names of the different groups of organisms that we detected, but you could see that it's quite a diverse community of microbes. And then when you look what happens throughout the disinfection process, you could see that things change dramatically when we disinfect the water in terms of the relative abundance. And some of these populations become very abundant uh, and others kind of die out. So the ones that die out are um, um, being killed by the disinfectants. The ones that become larger here are resistant to disinfectants and basically, in a way, if you will, are enriched in the disinfection process. So this is, of course, uh, interesting and a potential concern that we want to pay attention to. So how can we use that information to think about how, oops, Let's see how um, bacteria survive. Uh, so what I did here is I took part of the treatment process of a typical treatment plant. This is actually a schematic of the Ann Arbor treatment plant. So there's a few steps before this GAC filter here. And after filtration, this water is going through a disinfection step with chloramines. And then the water is being distributed going to your homes. So within this uh, filter, you have quite a microbial community of microbes that are helping to treat the water. Uh, to make this filter work, we need to backwash the filter to make sure that there's not too much biomass that builds up in the filter. So regularly, these filters are being backwashed. And this backwash water comes out of this reservoir. This is after disinfection, so there is disinfectant in the backwash water. So as you can imagine, by backwashing with this water that has disinfectant, we're putting a selective pressure on the microbes in this filter, similar to what I showed you in that experiment, in that disinfection experiment. So is that a good thing? I think it's, it's not really a good thing. I wish we could do something about it and take away this selective pressure on the microbes in the filter. 
Uh, so one suggestion, one simple suggestion would be to backwash without disinfectant so that we take away the selective pressure on the filter and at least are producing filter effluent that doesn't have resistant microbes in them. We could go further and enhance biological treatment to uh, limit availability of residual nutrients so that we don't have a lot of growth substrate, food for the microbes available after the water is being distributed. Uh, so uh, we can do that in various ways to enhance the biological treatment in the filter. And we could go even further and completely eliminate disinfection. If we do a really good job with the treatment here, perhaps we don't need uh, the disinfection at all and we can avoid the selective pressure of creating resistant microbes and avoid distributing them uh, into the distribution system. Um, so, you know, we can take steps further and think about um, how can we even uh, introduce positive microbes or non-pathogenic microbes uh, that could be beneficial to our health. Um, you know, you can have in our, uh, organisms that don't really do much in terms of pathogenicity or that don't do much in terms of health, but there are some organisms that could actually benef be beneficial for your health. So can we, can we actually uh, accomplish this in our tap water? Um, and so this is uh, future research ideas where we can use the filter, this, this biofilter, and if we can um, select the right organisms in this filter, perhaps we can accomplish uh, this in our treatment plan. So the idea is, can we make this filter into a strategy to produce probiotic water, right? So this is pretty far reaching and it's kind of out there in terms of ideas. I'm not saying we'll be able to accomplish this in the next few years, but it's something to think about. If we can control what's going on here, perhaps we can send the right microbes into your system since we can't avoid the microbes from, you know, they're going to be there no matter what we do. Um, we, we kind of alluded to this idea in one of our research papers and that was just picked up by a lot of people. So we got a lot of press just kind of throwing out an interesting idea at the end of a research paper. So I just wanted to show you some of these articles where people are starting to uh, kind of uh, basically derive way too much out of a suggestion that we made in a paper. But it was, it was an interesting experience, nevertheless. Um, in a, in, in a future research project, uh, you know, basically a project that we're starting right now, we're, we're also going to explore strategies to, to really focus in on vulnerable populations, immunocompromised people, and see how the drinking water may affect them. And so then our focus is going to be very much on the premise plumbing, the, the water that it comes into your home, and see how the plumbing system in your homes may affect things and make things different from what is going on in the distribution system or in the drinking water treatment plants. And this is a new project that's funded by Amcube. It's also kind of out there in terms of idea, so we don't really have external funding for it. But the people who are involved are listed here and uh, graduate student Nadine Kotlars has uh, started to work on this project. Um, uh, this, these were my examples from the drinking water field. I've briefly want to touch on some of the examples that I'm um, really only one example that I'm working on in, in the wastewater field and then wrap up with this uh, final point here. Um, I, I'm only going to talk about one example in the wastewater field, but we have quite a few things going on there in collaboration with Nancy and others. And so I just wanted to just point out those different projects because uh, some of my close colleagues here in the department are involved. And so one of these projects deals with energy recovery from municipal solid waste. Uh, Dimitri Zekos and graduate student Chun Chang Fei are working on that project. I'm also collaborating with people in the School of Natural Resources and the Environment on a related project. Well, it's not really related, it's quite different in fact, but it fits into this broad framework on working on resource recovery. Uh, of, uh, in this case, sustainable shrimp aquaculture. And uh, Jim Diana and Greg Heolian are the two collaborators from SNRE. And the project that I do want to talk briefly about is one in which we're trying to recover energy from domestic wastewater. We're doing that in a couple of different ways. Um, we have a new project supported by Corolla engineers that Anton Dobczyk is working on. Um, but the project that I just want to highlight in a little more detail is the one uh, that we've been working on for a long time. That's why we have all these funding sources here. And here are the 
collaborators on that project, uh, as well as the graduate students um, who are involved. Uh, so you see Steve Skurlos and Nancy Love, two of my very close colleagues that I've done a lot of work with, and uh, I really want to acknowledge for, for their contributions. Um, this project focuses on domestic wastewater treatment. Um, this is a very conventional scheme of domestic wastewater treatment, and the heart of the system is a biological reactor in which we oxidize organic compounds to remove them from the wastewater. There's lots of problems with that kind of a configuration, and uh, they're highlighted here. Uh, you can see that it's very expensive and energy intensive because there's aeration involved. Um, we produce a lot of byproducts that need to be treated and disposed of. It's very um, high footprint, physical footprint. So there's lots of issues with that kind of a treatment technology, and we're trying to change that to make it more sustainable. One of the ideas that we've had for some time and that we've been working on for some time is replacing that heart of the treatment plant with an anaerobic membrane bioreactor process. And the advantages of that are highlighted here. We would produce biogas, so recover energy from wastewater. We avoid the very expensive aeration step, produce much less byproducts, and have a much smaller physical footprint. Um, so these are the proposed benefits of this system. Uh, Adam Smith uh, ran a lab scale system to demonstrate proof of concept, and he was uh, very successful in operating this bench scale system at ambient conditions. This is the average wastewater temperature here in Ann Arbor. That's why we picked this temperature. Um, so even at very low temperatures for anaerobic treatment, most systems are run at 35 degrees C out in the real world. We run this uh, at ambient conditions, don't heat it. So we let it uh, <coughs> run at the actual temperature that, it, that, that we experience here. Um, and the system performed very well for domestic wastewater treatment, but there were some issues. Um, a lot of the methane that's produced is dissolved in the effluent because we're running at the ambient low temperatures. So we need to deal with that to avoid global warming issues with, because of methane. And also to uh, avoid uh, fouling on the membranes, uh, we need to put in a lot of energy. So Yes, we're gaining energy, but we're losing energy by sparging to reduce fouling on the membranes. Um, so we more recently started asking this uh, question, how is, is these, are these processes really contributing to sustainability here? And to try to address this in a more quantitative way, uh, Steve Skurlos uh, helped some of our graduate students to really work on a life cycle assessment and life cycle costing and using this approach we identified some very specific design targets uh, for our future work. So we still believe in this technology, but we've kind of changed a little bit and we're now focusing more on making this new technology more sustainable and what are the uh, uh, target, targets that we need to achieve to actually make this technology feasible. And uh, we're going to do this by uh, running a pilot scale system out at uh, the Northfield Wastewater Treatment Plant about 10 miles north of Ann Arbor. So we're setting up an anaerobic bioreactor. We've gotten membrane units from three different membrane companies, uh, a flat sheet membrane, uh, a hollow fiber membrane, and a ceramic membrane. And um, with this system, we're going to use the approach uh, from Steve's work to identify these uh, design targets and operational targets to make this system successful and make it fit into our sustainability approach that, we, that we've been working on. Okay, so that was my example from the wastewater field and now I kind of want to wrap, wrap up things and see uh, what you think about bringing these two fields together. Um, you see this this purple pipe here, I don't know if you're familiar with purple pipes, that color is used for uh, re distributing reclaimed water. We don't see a lot of these purple pipes here in Michigan, but if you go out west, you see, uh, you see these purple pipes. People are using reclaimed water extensively already. Um, so back to the Ann Arbor water cycle. I told you I would come back to this um, and uh, remember where the drinking water treatment plant is versus the wastewater treatment plant. So how does the Huron River flow? This is downstream, right? So Dexter is up here somewhere, if I get this right, Dave. <laughs> um, Ypsilanti is on this side. 
So where would you prefer to live if you just think about the world? So you live in Dexter, so you're, you're good. Um, it doesn't really matter. If you look at this cartoon here, um, you get a sense of the Huron River, for example, Ann Arbor, Dexter, and Ypsilanti. But you know, no matter where you live, you're going to be exposed to somebody else's um, affluent. Right? We do treat our wastewater well and so on, but some of these compounds that are present in our wastewater are going to make a true wastewater treatment plant and are going to end up in our surface waters and are going to be re reused for drinking water production. So indirect water reuse is a reality already for many of us, including those of us in Ann Arbor because we get some uh, Dexter water. Um, it's the indirect reuse that's very common. The direct reuse is becoming also quite a bit more common. And here's a treatment schematic of a, what I would say now conventional reuse scheme where domestic wastewater is treated by aerobic biological treatment followed by microfiltration, followed by reverse osmosis, disinfection through UV, and finally drinking water. There's a lot of places in the world that use this scheme already, believe it or not. Uh, Singapore was probably a pioneer and they're really clever about marketing this scheme. Uh, they call the water that is being distributed uh, either through bottles or through a distribution system, new water. I don't know if you've heard of this. When you visit Singapore, you, buy, you can buy new water, which is basically very advanced, uh, very highly treated uh, wastewater. Okay, so this is going on in many places in the world, Middle East, Singapore, the southwest of the U.S. is doing quite a bit of this as well. Um, these are technically feasible, but very, very expensive and energy intensive technologies, uh, in particular RO and UV. So one of the things that I've been thinking about is how can we use the technologies that we've worked on extensively to come up with a more sustainable reuse scheme. And we think that the anaerobic membrane bioreactor has potential to provide uh, one of the treatment steps. We need to do sample treatment. Um, I would like to see some of the biofilters that we've worked on in the drinking water field linked into this scheme to then uh, produce drinking water. Uh, you notice that I don't have the disinfection here because in, an Id in my ideal world we would be doing this treatment so well that we wouldn't have to do disinfection. And so in my ideal world we would actually be creating the right microbes uh, in the filter to uh, produce healthy water with, with probiotic um, capacities. So th this is future thinking. I don't know how close we are to this. But I hope with this kind of an overview talk, I've given you a sense of how our research in environmental biotechnology can contribute to these uh, big sustainability questions in the urban water cycle and, and global uh, global water issues in general. Uh, and so with that, I'm happy to answer questions if there's time. I didn't pay attention to the time, so uh, sure. yeah.